studying uh, mainly based in our presentations from the Gospel of John. I hope it has been a blessing to you. Amen. I hope you know it's, it's, it has allowed you to hear Jesus speaking more directly to your hearts and to your lives and to the issues that we deal with every day. Because um, John wrote these things that we might believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And that by believing, we might have faith in him and be saved. Um, we are in our second week. So on this coming weekend, after tonight, we don't meet tomorrow night. We meet again on 
Friday evening, but after, so then we will move into our third week. Yeah. So, you know, time just goes by just like that. What I would like you to be aware of is that um, this coming weekend is special because we spoke about earlier one of our earlier messages from the Bible that God says we ought to remember something. He says we should remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. He also reminds us from creation in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2 to Exodus straight through to the New Testament where it was his custom and Paul's custom. He reminds us that we are to come to worship. So this Friday night, this Saturday morning at 11 o'clock and then this Saturday evening at 7 o'clock we want to invite you to be a part of celebrating all of this. The Bible says that come taste and see that the Lord is what? Good. Is good. Is God good? All the time. Has he been good to you? Yes. Amen. So we, we, we come to taste and to see and to smell and to feel and to experience that we serve a good God. So I want to invite you this evening to be reminded to be here on this coming weekend so we can we have our Sabbath presentation, celebration presentation. And if, you're, if, if you desire to, you don't even have to go home after we have our 11 o'clock presentation because there will be a fellowship lunch provided for all. I can tell you this. These folks can cook. They put their foot in it. They are good. So be sure that you are here. It's a part of the whole fellowship that we do together. All right? And as you come and you bring a friend, God has promised to bless us. So those are just reminders that I wanted to share with you. All right? Um, we want to remind you, and the pastor is advising that we probably should leave that end, that... Uh, we had promised this evening that we would be having an anointing service for those who desire. And I talked with you about it. I hope you have been prayed up and prepared. Because this is not the oil. <laughs> it is not the pastor. It is not the man. It is Jesus Christ. Amen. And he wants us, when we come to him, to come with our hearts ready. Yeah. So I hope you have been praying and asking God to be a part of your experience that we could claim that the miracles that Christ did, as we read about in the Bible, when he healed the paralytic man. Yes. You remember? Amen. We, we covered that as one of our presentations. Um, when he healed the blind man, told him to go wash, when he made mud put on his eyes, and he came back seeing. He says, once I was blind, but now I what? See. See, so regardless of what your experience has been, God is able, the same God yes. who was in Christ yes. in the world 2,000 years ago, his words today is just as powerful as his words back then. Amen. And so we want to be prepared for what God can do. Yeah. And as God intervenes and steps into your life, and you have a testimony, let us know. We want to testify of the goodness of God. Won't you say amen? Amen. amen. God bless you. As So we will have the anointing at the end of the service. We will do it afterwards. May God bless you. At this time, I would like to ask you if you would join me in a special prayer tonight. We are living in a world of uncertainty. People wake up, ready to move on with their lives, go out, and they don't come back in. We want to pray for our country, for our leaders, for our uh, communities. We want to just, we want, and, and, and that includes ourselves. Amen. So as I kneel and pray, I would like for you to pray in your heart. God hears the prayers of his people. Amen? Amen. And I know we're going to have the special anointing 
prayer towards the end, but, but right now I want you, as I pray, to agonize with God. There is something on your heart that you need God to do. It's not, I'm not talking about your material things where you need God to provide job or whatever. No, I'm talking about going beyond that. I'm talking about a spiritual need that you have. I want you to join me in prayer as we seek God's face. That will help prepare our hearts for receiving the anointing that God has for us later on tonight. So if you would bow your heads with me, if you would kneel, those who are able to, we will seek our God in prayer. Almighty Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you so much that you love us so much. And Lord God, we thank you for wrestling with us as stubborn as we have been in our lives to come to the realization that no greater love has won than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. And Lord Jesus, before we were your friends, you called us friends. While we were Yet sinners, you died for us. While we were still your enemies, you went to the cross for us. And we want to say thank you, Jesus. Thank you so much that in spite of our rebellion, you have still been faithful. You have still been good. You have still been a God of mercy, even though you are also a God of justice. And you put the justice on yourself so that we may have mercy. Lord, we thank you. We thank you so much. And Lord God, because we recognize that we are unworthy, we recognize that we need you moment by moment, day by day, hour by hour. We come, oh God, confessing our faults to you. You know what they are. You know our shortcomings. You know our failings. And Lord, we confess those to you. We don't need an accuser to remind us of how bad we are. We see that for ourselves because your spirit has already brought that conviction to our hearts. It is not a conviction where we feel guilty, Lord God. It's a conviction where we feel the need to, to cry out to you and thank you for revealing it to us so that we can come to you and ask you, Lord, forgive us for our sins. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Restore unto us the joy of your salvation. And Lord God, not only when we have received that, we will share that with others and tell others that the God who delivered us, the God who saved us, the God who loves us, also loves them as well. And so, Lord, we thank you. We thank you so much. We pray right now for the speaker of the hour, that you would anoint his mind and his heart and his voice and anoint our ears and our minds as we hear the word of God and as he shares the word of God. We pray for those who are on their way. We ask, O oh God, that you would bless them with every spiritual blessing and bless us here with every spiritual blessing. Be with the leaders of our country. Lord God, there is so much turmoil, so much division, so much infighting. But Lord God, you are still in the midst. It is you who have ordained men to be where they are. And Lord, we know that even though it may look crazy right now, you have a plan. And we don't trust in senators and in congressmen and in state representatives. We trust in the living God. And we know that it doesn't matter who is talking right now. No matter who is leading right now. You are still King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Yeah. And so we know that we have nothing to fear because you still have everything under control. Be with those who are in Oklahoma and Texas where they are suffering from uh, floods and tornadoes. Lord God, we know these are just signs of the times. And we pray that you would help them to recover. But most importantly, Lord God, may what they are going through right now remind them how fragile the, this life is and that they can make their calling and election sure in you. Father, we thank you for the privilege to pray. And we continue to pray while we are here tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, tonight, our message... Um, in many cases, funerals can be a difficult time. Um, someone that you have spent your life with, someone that you have known, is no longer with us. And so was the case 
in Jerusalem one day as Jesus, as, as, as a mother was burying her child, as, uh, as oftentimes it is, there's a lot of people crying uh, because this is a loss. And it's, it's even devastating when it is a child that's being buried by uh, his or her parent. But you know, when Jesus is around, Anything that's dead can't stay dead. Glory to God. Because he is the resurrection and the life. Amen. And so as the modern slang goes that we want to turn up. Mm -hmm. See, Jesus was turning up before we coined the phrase turn up. The reality is that whenever Jesus comes in your life, he's going to turn things up. Yeah. He's going to shake things up. He's going to turn things around. So tonight, after our message in song, Listen to our evangelist share with us how Jesus turned up at a funeral. Happy Wednesday evening, anyone. Thank you. 
when I was a kid, I was an exceptional reader. I went to a Catholic grammar school and there was this nun who put me into these public speaking competitions. First time I went, I came to my second or third place. And so when I was a kid, I was constantly speaking in front of large groups of people. And I really just liked it. A relative of mine became a rock star. So when he would come to New York to do like a Saturday Night Live or Grammys or some sort of show, I would go and just, I would be in that world and I was just like meeting all these people and just seeing my cousin on television and just like all of this stuff. I just like, I want, I want to live like that. You know, what can I do? And I thought, well, I can act. I did an off-Broadway show. I got part, little, you know, guest spots and episodic television that was shooting in New York. <laughs> And then I got a movie, and then that movie led to another movie, and then I got a television recurring role on a series. So I would walk around and people would recognize me. Hey, I like your work. The money got good. I was able to support myself. It became fame, like validation, attention, money. Uh, became an idol. Everything was just taken care of. And wherever I went, someone knew who I was. All of a sudden, I was signing autographs. Everywhere I went, hanging out, you know, famous people, and I thought, like, this is it, like, this is it. And when it started to slow down, I was addicted to the attention. And eventually, you know, got less autographs to sign, the phone rings a little bit less, uh, you know, the, the, the famous people stop calling, you know, they stop getting invited to parties. Things just slowly slip away, and then, so I just kind of clung to what I knew or what was easy, which was drugs, um, and women. And that led to just about three or four years of the worst nightmares that I, that I could possibly ever imagine, including homelessness, being downtown LA, literally uh, smoking crack um, in a box, you know, with a homeless person. I was trying to fill this, this hole, this, this vacuum, and uh, I just found relief in drugs. Whoever thinks they would be in jail, I certainly didn't. But like, here I am, I'm in jail, and I'm like shackled to other people on the floor. And I remember thinking, what is that? What is that, that prayer? Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, like I remember thinking that. And that's all I could remember. I could remember. I was like, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And I couldn't remember the rest of it. But just repeating that over and over helped the time pass and gave me a sense of just a little bit more ease. And then they finally called my number and I knew I was gonna leave this sort of holding cell and go up and have my own cell. I got up to my cell and I sat down and I looked up on the wall and from top to bottom, there was Psalm 23. in really big letters. <laughs> and uh, I felt like this hand go over me and I slept like I hadn't slept in years. And I, that's when I knew I was like, okay, I hear you. Things did change after that, you know. I, I got into rehab and I kept going to rehab. I would get out of rehab and relapse and then I started doing 12-step programs and eventually I got clean. In the 12-step program, you know, they talk about God a lot in the steps. So it was the first place that I went and I was like thinking about, okay, what is God? And like, what did I believe in when I was a kid? What do I believe now? So. I always considered myself a searcher. Like I tried, I tried Scientology, I tried Hare Krishna. Always like something came along and I wanted to see if it worked, you know, if it worked. And so there was a girl on Facebook I never met and she had Christian. I contacted her, I said, hey, you're a Christian, right? She said, yeah. I said, will you take me to church? And she took me to her church. All of a sudden, when I get in there, there's this pastor speaking. And he said, did you ever, have you ever been told your whole life that you were special or you were talented and these gifts took you places because 
you, 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 you use these gifts to serve yourself. And they took you places that you never imagined. And I was like, that's my experience. And then he said, but it also took you to dark places, low places, where, where you never thought you'd go. And I just started bawling. Because that was my experience. Red carpet, the movies, the money, the, you know, the, the validation, like all of it, to like downtown LA, needles, a homeless box. So I just kept going, being in community, uh, being in, in at, at worship, being surrounded by the Christians, and then I started to understand about Jesus until I got to love Jesus and understand and, and share the gospel and really have a relationship with Christ. What I understand about being saved is knowing that there's this peace that I can't understand. No matter how much money is in my account or not, whether I'm working as an actor or not, I never felt that peace ever, 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 ever. It was always contingent and conditional on having money, having sex, or having some power. interesting presentations so far, but tonight is another special one, and I hope, it's be, hope it will be a blessing to you. Let us bow our heads as we pray. Our God, you've been good to us. You've been faithful, faithful. Yes. Sometimes we have not trusted you or doubted you when we should but you've always been faithful to us. So one more time tonight, Lord, open our hearts, open our minds to hear you speak to us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 One of the most controversial topics the issue of death, issue of what happens when a person dies. And so tonight we will examine what does God say in Scripture about death. Every culture, in every part of the world, in every part of the world, In third world countries and first world countries, people have their various beliefs about death. And this picture is from a place in Sagada, in the Philippines, where the people believe that the closer a coffin is to the sky, is the closer the deceased is to heaven. And so they would hang coffins on these cliff sides, high up as high as possible, so that the deceased can be closer to heaven. And then, these are Buddhists. In most form of Buddhi uh, Buddhism, the bodies would be cremated or given over to animals in an act of charity. But these are some Buddhists in Tibet. And there's little wood for burning for cremation. So they have a practice of putting the dead bodies out there and allowing vultures to pick the bodies clean. <laughs> I say the same thing, mercy. Hope they pick your eyes out first. <laughs> but, but 
It's, it's, it's just a horrible picture to see that. Afterwards, they would then ground the bones up and feed those bones to the crows. <laughs> so this confusion about what takes place when a person dies, what happens, is not new. But it's important that we have a clear Bible understanding of what occurs when an individual dies. First um, Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1 says, In the last times, some people will abandon the faith by following deceitful, teach, deceitful spirits, the teachings of demons. Because as a result of confusion about what occurs when an individual dies, people end up with beliefs that are not biblical and practices that are not biblical. And we put ourselves in a condition and in a place where the devil himself can mess with us. They say belief kills and belief cures. So it's important that we believe the right things. I just want to read the scriptures for you. Um, in... John chapter 11. I hope you have your Bibles again. John chapter 11. It's in your, and there's a Bible on your phone if you don't have one looking like this. So John chapter 11. And we're going to quickly look at how Jesus related to death. <clears throat> I'm assuming you are there by now. John chapter 11. Now a certain man was sick. Lazarus of Bethany. The town of Mary, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. So you got the impression very clearly that Jesus had a relationship with this family. That it said, He whom you love is sick. And we are told that Jesus often. Whenever he traveled that way and he needed some place to stay, this was a home that was very hospitable to his needs. So he stayed there with them often. But when Jesus, verse 4, heard that he was sick, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Now that don't make any sense. Let me read that again. Now Jesus loved Martha and Mary, loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed two more days. Did you get that? Anybody ever had a desire to go visit somebody who was sick? You know, here are the persons in the hospital. And he said, you know what? I'm getting there today to visit them. And then two weeks later, you remember you haven't been there. But then it is too late. The person has passed and you're feeling bad about it. So most of us know when you hear somebody is very sick. You don't hang around if you want to see the person again. You, 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 you do your very best to get there as quickly as possible. So it doesn't make sense that when Jesus, who loved his family, heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews have sought to stone you. And are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in a day? If anyone walks in a day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this day. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. These things he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus does what? Sleeps. Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. Anybody has been sick? Anybody? Yeah, you know, sometimes whatever it is, you know, maybe just the flu, although there's no just the flu, flu kills. <laughs> yeah. But you're sick. Now, if you're sick, I'm told, especially if you have the flu, you need a lot of liquid and you need to sleep. You need rest. So if you are resting, you don't want anybody to come wake you up. Not even Jesus. You know, leave me alone, let me sleep. So I can get well soon. So that's what the disciples thought. He says, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. If he's asleep, 
that means everything is all right. He's doing well enough so that he can sleep. He can uh, get up and feel rested. However, Jesus spoke, verse 13. Are you with me? Jesus spoke of his death. But they thought that he was speaking about taking rest in sleep. So Jesus was calling his, 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 his death just a sleep. And there's a reason for him doing that. And we'll get there. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus, verse 14, Lazarus is what? Dead. Is dead. You know, I, I just said he was sleeping, but really, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sake that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. And so it's important that we have a clear understanding, even the disciples with Jesus was here having some moments of confusion, whether he was sleeping or whether he was really dead. There's some lies that the devil tells. And this was his first one. <laughs> Where in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 4, the devil told the first couple, Adam and Eve, you shall not surely what? Die. God had said, don't do certain things. Don't eat of the fruit of this very tr special tree. Because the day you eat of the fruit of this tree, you will surely die. And so the devil comes along and says to them, don't listen to God, for you will not surely die. And ever since then, there's been this confusion about what happens in death. Is he really dead or not? You know, there's a, 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 a few years ago, perhaps about five years ago or so, a little boy wrote this book. Um, he was uh, probably about 14, wrote a book about his death where he had gone and seen stuff. So he came back and was writing about what he had seen. And then later on, he recanted. He said that he hadn't really seen anything. He was just in a coma. You know? And he had had what they call this near-death experience. And he had decided to make some money off it. So he wrote a book. But we have so much confusion based on this lie that, when, that the dead is not really dead. That they are sleeping, they are gone somewhere, they are, you, you know, all kind of stories are told. And this comes from the first lie said by the devil that you shall not surely die. So let's go back to the beginning then to examine what occurs when God made man. The Bible says, and the Lord God did what? Form man of the dust of the ground. And Genesis 2 verse 7. And he did, did what? Breathe into his nostril what? The breath of life. And man became what? A living soul. Man became a living soul. Man Say that with me. Man became a living soul. Notice that's different from man received a living soul. The Bible is very clear. In the Hebrew, uh, as it is written... That man didn't receive a soul. Man became a soul. Right? There's a difference there. And we're going to examine that a little more. So the scripture wants us to know very clearly that the dust of the ground from which man was made plus the breath of life that God gave man equals a what? A living soul. A living soul. So that if you take away one of these if one plus one equal two, and you take away one, how much you have left? One. You don't have two left. So that if you take away the dust of the ground, and you separate that from the breath of life, do you still have a living soul? In actual fact, death is creation in reverse. And so that elements of the earth minus the breath equals a what? A dead body, a dead soul. A dead soul. The body without the breath or the spirit is dead. The body without the breath or the spirit is dead. And, and don't understand breath like 
how I'm breathing here now. You know, the, the breath the Bible speaks of, that God breathe, God breathe into, because, you know, God doesn't breathe like you and I. So this God breathe is that God is giving to man the, 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 the context of what brings life to man. So that when he formed man from the dust of the ground, all that occurred was like a little doll. But when God brought the spark of life into that body, he did something that not even the devil can do. He brought life. And so when he takes away the breath of life, what you have is not a, a, a living soul that is left behind to wander all over. Now you have a dead body, or you could even say a dead soul. And so see what the Bible says. It says, put not your trust in womb, princes, nor in the, in womb there is no help. His breath goeth, he returneth to his, in that very day his what? His thoughts perish. You, the Bible couldn't be clearer. That we shouldn't trust the fables we hear people share about death. We should trust the word of God, the one who made us in the beginning. And he says that when the breath goes, when God takes back the spark of life, it's like having a car. And if the spark plug is acting up with all the gasoline that you have, it could be, it could be the, 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 the A grade, the top grade. If there's not that spark to spark the gasoline, then the car will never move. It will be a dead car. So it says when his breath returns, he returns to his earth in that very day, even your thoughts perish. A dead man has no thoughts. He can't think because he's dead. And that's what the Bible is making very clear in Psalm 146, verse 3 and 4. That very day, his thoughts will perish. And so the Bible also tells us if his thoughts perish, then the soul, if the, if, if, if the breath goes and the body remains, then the soul dies. In fact, here's a text that says a soul can die. The text is found in Ezekiel. It says the soul that sinneth, it shall what? It shall die. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. And then another text from e Ecclesiastes says, For the living, who is the living? Us. For those of us who are alive, we know that we shall what? We shall die. That's why people get scared. I think I shared with you quickly a story many years ago of being on a plane and we had some problems with the hydraulics while we were uh, 30,000 feet up and we were not sure whether we would land, but praise God we landed and there was a young lady that was on the plane who shared her testimony. She said when she got up off her seat, her seat was wet. And it wasn't because she was perspiring. She was just scared that she would die. For the living know that they will what? But the dead know a lot of stuff. The dead can tell you stuff. The dead can dream you stuff. The dead can tell you what your horoscope means. You sure? Yeah. If you believe the Bible, that's what the Bible says. Yeah. Do you believe the Bible? Yeah. Praise the Lord. It says the living know that they shall die. But the dead know not anything. I mean, that couldn't be clearer. They know nothing. They know nothing. And here's, here's what they don't know. His sons come to honor. Could be even his daughters come to honor. <laughs> And he knoweth it not. And if they are brought low, but he perceiveth it not. So whether your son is promoted or is fired, when you're dead, you don't know. <laughs> he knows nothing that is happening. And so according to the text then, dead people don't know what their loved ones are doing on earth right now. They don't know. They don't know. What is happening with their loved ones? Loved ones are married and they're having a lot of children and you are now the recipient of 
a hundred great grand and great great grands and grandchildren you don't know. My grandfather, my grandmother, on both sides have passed many years ago. And they don't know what is happening. It's like when you're sleeping. <laughs> Do you know what's happening? Some of you sleep your life away. You, know, you wake up and you don't know what time it is. I got up recently in the hotel room and for, uh, actually, I think it was, was it this morning? Because I, I went back to Bering Springs in Michigan yesterday and I drove back. And so when I came, when I woke up, I wasn't sure which bed I was in. Because <laughs> I was so far sound asleep that I almost got out of the bed on the wrong side and walked into the wall. So that, you know, when you're dead, there, there, there is, it, it's even more than when you're sleeping. You have no sense of the passage of time. You, have, you don't know whether it is 1 o'clock in the morning or it is time to get up and go to work. They know nothing that is happening. The Bible is very clear. It says that neither do the dead praise not the Lord. The dead do what? They praise not the Lord. Neither any that go down into silence. The dead don't praise the Lord. So it sort of means if the dead aren't praising the Lord, then the dead are not in heaven. Because if they were in heaven, where the angels are always praising God, saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou king of saints. If the dead were in heaven up there, they would have to get in on some of the action. But they are not in heaven. The Bible says, The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go up into noise. Oh, that's not what the text says. They, any that what? Go down into silence. I mean, the text couldn't be any clearer than that. Am I, am I right? Here's another one. In Job chapter 7, 9 and 10. As the cloud is consumed and vanisheth away, so he that goeth down to the? Rain. Goeth down to where? Rain. So that's the silence that they go down to. The silence in the grave. He that goeth down to the grave shall come up no more. He shall return no more to his house, neither shall his place know him anymore. Anybody here afraid of ghosts? Halloween? Ooh. <laughs> what the Bible is trying to say, what the Bible is trying to say, if you think that you see something, it ain't your dead grandmother. It's probably the devil himself. Because <laughs> she is down in the grave in silence. And she can't return to her place anymore. That's what the, is, isn't that very clear? Right. And either we believe the Bible or we don't believe the Bible. And if we choose to believe the Bible, it is very clear that when a person dies, he goes to his grave. And when he goes to his grave, he stays there. He shall return no more to his house. Remember when I was a child growing up in the Caribbean, I used to hear that when a person dies, that in certain villages, in the, in the rural areas, that the, the people would be scared that their loved ones are coming back. And so they would move their bed, you know, so your husband dies. And, and you're afraid that he will come back. So you would move the bed from over here to over here. <laughs> so when he comes back, he can't come and lay down beside you in the bed at all. Because the bed is somewhere else. Now if you're smart enough to leave the grave and come back. How comes moving a little bed over here is going to make a difference? Doesn't make any sense, does it? But people believe all these fables that are not based on the Bible. Are you with me? He shall not come back to his place anymore. And so let's, let's look a little more deeply now. As Jesus deals with this issue of death. The, the King James Bible uses the word soul how many times? 1600 times. But never once does it use the word immortal soul. And the word immortal mean what? 
it can never die. But the Bible never says the soul can never die. We actually just looked at a text that says the soul that sinned, it, it shall what? It, it shall die. So that the soul dies. In fact, man doesn't, as I said, man is, the, the breath that God breathes into us is not the soul. So man doesn't receive a soul. It's when the, the dead body gets the breath of life, it becomes everything, becomes a soul. And so you can't take the milk and the egg out the flour and you still have a cake. <laughs> no, it's when you add the milk and the flour together that you make a cake. But if you extract one, you don't have a cake left over. Are you with me now? Only God is immortal. And the Bible declares death is asleep. How many times? 53 times. And we're going to examine why the Bible calls death asleep. What is it that the Bible was trying to say? So here's Jesus. He told his disciples, Our friend Lazarus does what? Sleepeth. But I go that I may wake him out of sleep. I go that I may wake him out of his sleep. Lord, they said. Let's go back there. If he sleepeth, he shall do well. How be Jesus spoke of his? Yeah. Death. They thought he had spoken of what? Taking of rest in, in sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. That's what I meant. Lazarus is what? Dead. Is dead. And so that's what Jesus meant. So we're going to look at it in a little more detail. It says Lazarus is dead. What about the thief on the cross then? You know, they, they, they want to answer those questions that people may have. Or that we may have heard. When the thief on the cross died, was he really dead? Or did he die and then go to heaven that day with Jesus? Those are questions that, that need to be addressed as we reflect on what the Bible says about death. So here it is. Here it is. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou what? Comest into thy kingdom. Remember me. So Jesus was nailed to the cross. There were two thieves on either side of him. One thief was just a, 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 a mocking Jesus, taunting Jesus. I thought you said you were God. Why don't you get off the cross? Save yourself and save us. The other thief looked at Jesus and realized this is no ordinary man. This man must be the son of God. So he cried out, Lord, won't you remember me? When you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto you, unto thee today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. Let me read that again. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. So people have taken that to say that when Jesus was on the cross, that when he, Jesus died, Jesus went to paradise, which is heaven, and the thief went with him because that's what Jesus just said to him. Well, let's explore that a little more. Let's explore that a little more. It, it's important to look carefully at what the text says. All right? So, and Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee today, Thou shalt be with me in paradise. I bet some of you didn't notice the change. Okay, so look carefully at this, the screen. And tell me when you see the change. The comma. You see that? All right. And here's the reason why now. The Bible was not written with what? The Bible was not written with punctuations. All right? Was not written with punctuation. It was added. The punctuations we see in the Bible was added later on by the medieval church. And they added a punctuation that sort of bore out their understanding of what they think the text was trying to say. So they put the, 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 the comma in the wrong place. So that when you read it this way, and I say unto you, comma, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. It's not like Jesus was saying, today you're going to be with me in paradise. Versus this one, I say unto you today, I'm saying to you right now. Are you with me? 
Yeah. Jesus was just emphasizing the urgency of what he was talking about. I'm saying to you right now, I'm saying to you today, that you are going to be with me in paradise. And so the comma makes a difference. Jesus was not telling the thief that he's going to paradise today. Jesus was affirming to him today that he would be with him in paradise. And so that's the context. And that's why it's important to understand what occurred with the King James Version. The medieval, in the times of King James, when they wrote the Bible, they, just by putting the comma in the wrong place, brought their understanding of what happens to the understanding of Scripture. Number one, how do I know all of that? Did Jesus go to heaven when he died? If you what did the Bible say happened to him when, uh, when he died that Friday evening? He died on Friday evening. All right? He says, it is finished, the Bible says. Hung his head and died. What happened? They took his body off the cross, took him to the tomb, placed the body in the tomb. But who says he didn't go to heaven? How would we know that? Well, on Sunday morning, you know, for every dark Friday and for every long Sabbath, there is a resurrection. And on Sunday morning, resurrection morning, when Mary came to the tomb looking for Jesus, she went to the door of the tomb and she looked in and the Bible says that the tomb was empty. And she heard somebody behind her saying, what are you looking for? And she thought it was the gardener. And so she turned to say, where have they laid his body? And Jesus says, Mary. And she realized it wasn't the gardener. In her joy, she ran to hold him. And what the Bible is communicating, Jesus is saying here, don't detain me. Don't stop me, for I have not yet what? Ascended to my Father. So uh, even up to the third day, he had not yet gone to present the, 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 the results of his death, his sacrifice for our sins. He had not yet gone to present that to the Father. And so he couldn't have told the thief today, you're going to be with me in paradise. Because here he's saying, just a few verses later on, that he's not yet ascended to the Father. Are you with me now? Amen. So it is, it is important that we understand what the scripture is saying. And that's why John says, and you will what? Come on, you will what? Know the truth. And what will happen? It's the truth that will set you free. It's the truth that will set you free. Only by knowing the truth because it's lies that will enslave us to the devil, whom the Bible says the devil is the father of lies, but we serve a God of truth. Won't you say amen? amen. So we're going we're gonna to jump back to Lazarus. And so here's what the scripture says. In, in, in John chapter 11, we pick up, pick up the story that Jesus then went over to, to Bethany. And in verse 20, then Martha, as soon as she heard, that's John 11 verse 20, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. So, Lord, we know you have power to heal the sick. We know you have power to cure leprosy. We know that you have power even to heal people who are blind. And even the lame who can't walk, you have power to give them legs that they can walk. But you can't do anything about death. That's what Mary was saying. Because if you were here, you could have stopped it. And there was an accusation in her voice. You call yourself a friend of this man. You have slept in his bed. He has given up his bed for you when you passed through the stone. But you didn't come on time to help him when he needed you most. That's what she was saying to Jesus. That's the accusation that she was given. 
But Jesus says, verse 23, your brother will rise again. Your brother will rise again. Somebody say amen. amen. Praise the Lord. But Martha still didn't get it. She says, yes, I know he will rise again. Yeah, when, when, you know, in the last days, I know he will rise again, but I miss him right now. I want him right now. I wish you were here so he wouldn't die. And yes, I know when time comes and God returns and all the dead shall rise in Christ. I know he will rise again. Verse 24. But then Jesus said to her in one of the most profound I am statements, and there are seven I am's in the book of John, and every time Jesus says I am, he is saying I am God. Are you with me? When Moses stood by the burning bush thousands of years before and he saw the bush burning and the bush wasn't consumed and Moses realized that God had come down in the burning bush to talk to him. Moses says, when I go back to the Egyptians, who should I tell them that sent me? And God says, tell them I am that I am sent you. And so every time Jesus used the terminology I am, he was saying, I am God. I'm the same God that appeared to Moses in the burning bush. I am God. And so here he is. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, yet he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? So we're told, beloved, that Martha sent and told her sister, Jesus is here. And in verse 31, then the Jews were with her in the house and comforting her when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her, saying, she's going to the tomb to weep there. Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying, Lord, if thou had been here, my brother would not have died. Can you imagine how they tore up Jesus before he got over there? Yeah. yeah. So both of them came with the same thing. If you were here, our brother wouldn't have died. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews came with her weeping, he groaned in his spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, come and see. They thought Jesus was going to pay respect to the dead. You know, we go by the graveside. Some of us go by the graveside on Memorial Day or maybe the, the, the anniversary of the death of a loved one to pay our respect to the dead. So Jesus, I thought, was going to pay his respect to his dead friend. Come and see. The Bible says, verse, short its verse in the Bible, uh, John chapter eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept. And the Jew says, see how much he loved him. And some said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? And Jesus groaning in himself, verse 38, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone laid against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. And Martha, who says, I know he, I know he will rise up on the last day. It's like, Lord, this ain't the last day yet, so leave the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead how many days? Four days. And Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Yeah. I want to tell you something, beloved. This is not the first miracle of resurrection that Jesus would have performed. <laughs> there was a day when Jesus was walking with his disciples and they came to a, a city called Nain and they came to the city just in time to see a funeral train coming out of the city gates on their way to bury this person. And in the Eastern religion, even until today, they bury within 24 hours. Do you know that? They bury within 24 hours. And so that Jesus had resurrected this, little, this, this young man 
whose mother was crying as she led the, the funeral train out of the city of Nain to the burial site. And Jesus just happened to be there right on time. Healed him. Then there was Jairus' daughter. Jesus healed her. She had just died. The Jews believed, the Jewish belief, not the Bible, the Jews had a belief that it, really, it takes about four days for you to be really dead. So, Jesus heard Lazarus was sick. He didn't go. He waited two days afterwards. Then he went. And so by the time he got there, it was how many days now? Four days. So Jesus deliberately, didn't he say this was going to be for the glory of God? He deliberately waited so that nobody could say, he wasn't dead, it was just a coma. <laughs> you got it now. He made sure that there were no excuses. Because when he healed Jairus' daughter, the Bible said there were people there crying, wailing. They had hired professional mourners. Back then, if you have nobody to mourn for you, just go pay some money and they'd come, you know, put on a good cry for you. <laughs> I'm serious. They had professional mourners. And so they were mourning. So when Jesus walked in and says, I'm going to wake up this little girl, the Bible says they laughed him to scorn. But afterwards, they must have said, we thought she was dead, but she's not really dead. She was just in a coma. She was just, you know, she, she, she was just maybe in a deep, deep, deep sleep. And the same for the man at the gates of Nain. But here for Lazarus, four days. And how do we know that he's dead, really dead? For the body is even decaying. It's stinking, the Bible says. For he's been dead for four days. But Jesus says, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his head and said, his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me because of the people who are standing by. I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And somebody testified that if Jesus hadn't called Lazarus specifically by name, if he had gone before an empty tomb and just says, come forth, then all the dead since Adam would have walked out of their grave. He had to call Lazarus specially by name. I'm not talking about your dead grandma. I'm not talking about Abraham. I'm not talking about Moses. I'm only talking today about Lazarus. Lazarus, come forth. And the Bible says, And he who had died came out, bound hand and foot with grave cloth, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Loose him, and let him go. Loose him and let him go. This miracle is just spread all over Israel. You read in chapter 12. We're reading chapter 11. In chapter 12, somebody invited Jesus to a party they were having in Bethany. And Jesus and Lazarus, who was just resurrected, were guests of honor. <laughs> Can you imagine? I'm sitting beside a guy who was dead four days. What's going on, Lazarus? <laughs> How was it? When Jesus turns up, he turns off death. And that's why he calls those who die in Christ is just asleep. Are you with me? Because if, 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 if you die in Christ, Jesus has the key to wake you up. And that's what the Bible is actually saying here. That's what's occurring right here. Jesus said to, 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 to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet what shall happen? Yet shall he live. And here's one of my favorite texts. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. With what? With a shout. That, that's why I'm excited. I'm practicing for when the Lord shout, I can hear him. With the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead 
in Christ shall rise. The dead in Christ shall rise. Now tell me something. Which one of these stories has a happier ending? Because you know, I, I've always wondered. Suppose I should die before my wife and go to heaven. And some fellow, <laughs> some fellow decided now that he's out of the way, you know, this is my time. And I'm up in heaven watching him laying up in my bed. And he never used to even like me. Eating out on my plate. That's not happy. I would be miserable in heaven seeing that. But when the dead in Christ shall rise. Because the dead have gone down into the grave. And God has just says go sleep. Go sleep. Don't worry about a thing. Don't worry about whether she marry again or not. <laughs> Just go sleep. And whether it be one year, or ten years, or a hundred years, or a thousand years, when you open your eyes, it would be just like it was yesterday. Are you with me? Those of us who are alive, we understand that time has passed, but a person who is sleeping in Christ, they couldn't tell you how long they have been sleeping. They're not in any pain. They're not in any worry. They have no care or concern. They have done their part and they are now awaiting. If they have died in Christ, they are now awaiting Jesus to blow the trumpet, to give the shout, and to invite them to come home. Amen. Can you imagine the rejoicing? Yes. The shouts of joy on that day when loved ones meet again. Yes. When, when parents meet their children when spouses meet each other, when friends meet each other, when parents meet their children. Can you imagine how beautiful that will be? What a reunion! As we are saying, thank you, Jesus. As we are high-fiving each other, saying, thank you, Jesus, for being so faithful to us. We have waited in the grave, and now you have brought us back home. Only Jesus, who has the power of life, and the breath of life can breathe life again into dead souls and bring them back to life. Amen. The Bible is very clear with that. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will what? Dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. The text says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep but we shall all be what change in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed for this corruption shall do what put on incorruption and this mortal must put on what immortality we let me let me go i think we're going back then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written. Everybody say that with me. What happened now? Yes. Death. Come on, let me hear you again. Yes. Death is swallowed. swallowed up. Swallowed up in victory. Oh, death. Where's your pain? Where's your pain? Where's your pain? I was in church one Wednesday night for prayer meeting. And the mother stood at the back with her baby in her arms. For the baby had gotten a little, started to cry in church. And so she stood there, shook the baby. His, the baby stopped crying. I remember I looked at the baby, made faces, and the baby smiled at me. The next day I was in a meeting. Somebody says, Pastor, come now. I went down to the hospital. The baby had died from sudden infant death syndrome. But there's coming a day when the sting of death will pass. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, death, where is your sting? That's the mocking of a person who has put their life in Jesus Christ. And let me tell you, beloved, some of us here are Christians, and all of us ought to be, be a little afraid of death, not of the 
missing of life, but of the pain that could come. None of us want to go out of this world with a lot of pain. But I can tell you this, beloved, that if it's your time and your faith is in God, don't worry about it. Amen. When the devil used death to taunt you, look at him and say, that's the worst you can do? Because if that's the worst you can do, I got to tell you, my Jesus has the keys of hell and of death. <laughs> my Jesus has the keys of hell and of death. And when you lock the door, Jesus can open it back. He can open it back. One of the most frustrating things is not to have your keys with you. you know, I'm well known for losing my keys. You know, I'm ready to go and I'm walking around the house. To my wife, have you seen my keys? Can't find it. Or you've locked yourself out your car. Has that happened to you sometimes? And you're, you're, you're locked in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a difficult place. It's cold. And you're ready to go. But you can't find your key. But I'm here to tell you. Jesus has not lost his key. His key is the key that can open every death's door. If you give him your life. Death is not something to be scared of. If you give him your commitment. Death is just like a sleep. You're going home tonight to sleep? Well, that's what death will be like. But Jesus comes the next morning and he says, you've slept long enough. Won't you wake up? You've slept long enough. It's time to get up. Amen. And when he comes and the, the graves are opened. Yeah. And all of us here, I'm sure, have lost somebody. Yeah. All of us here, I'm sure, have lost a loved one. But when the graves open up and the fellowship is taking place, oh, what a day of rejoicing. That will be. I want to close. Will you accept Jesus' offer? To give you resurrection power for victory in your life today. Is that your desire? Is that your desire? We have some cards. I'm just going to ask you to take, the, take some cards quickly, please. And just, um, just fill them out for me. We, we, we want to pray for you. We are prayerful. And we believe that God wants you to make a renewed commitment that by the grace of God you've committed your life to him and you, your desire your desire is that when death comes it's just like a sleep for you. You may not go to heaven right now but you go to the grave and Jesus will mark that grave because one day he's going to open it for you. I say praise the Lord. Just take a moment and respond to that card for me. Just write your names, please. And then tick on the card. And then we're going to pray. My decision for Jesus today. Jesus is the one who has the power over hell and death. So you can respond. I believe Jesus is the Son of God revealed in the Bible. I accept his death for me and his life in me from this day on. I want to reaffirm my decision to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Or if you have any questions, you could quickly write those on the back. Shouldn't take you too long to do that. As soon as you're finished, you just hold your cards up. We can collect those cards as we... We move right, we're going to move right into our prayer time here. As soon as you finish your cards, just, just hold them up and uh, one of our pastors will come by and collect them for you, please. You may have done it a thousand times before. But the repetition deepens our impression that we are committing our lives to Jesus Christ tonight. Don't hesitate to do that. The finish just, just indicates so that I can come by. There's a card behind you, Ryan.
All right, if you have those cards, do you want to bring those cards up here? Bring, you have all the, bring all the cards for us. We're going to just take a few, about a five minutes for prayer. And we will um, lift these cards in our prayer as well. Pray for the decisions made by these individuals. Of a recommitment of their lives. We want to we wanna take this opportunity for that special prayer of anointing that we spoke about earlier tonight. If you would like to be anointed to be prayed over, I'd like to ask our elders to come forward at this time. We have our pastors that are here with us, our elders that are here with us. We, wanna, we don't want to hurry, but at the same time, we don't want to, uh, we want to be organized and plan effectively. So if you would take one here for me, know that the elders, some of them have an anointing oil with them. So we're standing right here. And what, we're, what you're seeing standing right here, right now, are individuals who are standing between life and death. Not that we have the power to save anyone, but God uses human beings as his hands and his feet. And our elders and our pastors here, we have committed ourselves to serve you, God's people. And so, without delaying or taking much time, if you have, you know what God is speaking to you about. Just come up, find one of the elders, and just say, hey, pray for me. You don't even have to tell them what you want them to pray for you for. Just, just tell them, pray for me. If you want to tell them what it is, pray for me for this. Pray for, pray for, you may, you may need to be standing in the gap for someone else. A husband, a, a, a wife, a, a friend, a co-worker, a, a colleague, a child. Come forward right now as we pray. Just find somebody to, just find somebody to pray with. Elders, do we all have your oil with you? You have your oil, you have your oil. If you don't, I'll make sure we get something here. All right? Just come forward at this time. The power is not in the, 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 the substance that we're holding here. What, the power is in your faith in God. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. So please find someone. Elder, if you don't have your oil, get your oil and just find somebody to pray with. I'll just share this text while we're getting ready to pray. The text says, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is any cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Gracious God, I bring before you Orlando. 
in the name of Jesus tonight, he has decided to trust you and to put his confidence and his faith in you. And Lord, you know his needs tonight.
Lord God, we lift up these cards before you. We know and you know what we have indicated here. We present them before you. And Lord, we pray that you would consecrate every person under the sound of my voice, and especially those who have indicated on this card that they want you to be their resurrection and their life. And as we leave this place, we leave believing in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because by believing in him, we shall be saved. Now, Lord, bless us and keep us. Cause your face to shine upon us. Lift up the light of your countenance upon us and give us your peace. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. God keep you. We look forward to seeing you Friday night. Where's the clicker? The clicker. We look forward to seeing you on Friday night where our message is entitled, Jesus versus the Traditions of Men. That will be this Friday night at 7 p.m. Jesus versus the Traditions of Men. God bless you. God keep you. We look forward to seeing you then. Good night.